All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your participation and hope you are all well. My name is Vanessa Scott, and I work in industry relations and innovation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, we are very excited to present our new Scripps Innovation Webinar hosted by the Scripps Corporate Alliance. Just a little bit of background about Scripps. Uh, we are a division of UC San Diego, and we were uh, originally founded in 1903. We have about 2,000 students, researchers, volunteers, and staff in our community. We produce about 700 research publications a year and receive approximately $214 million in sponsored research annually. And our mission at Scripps Oceanography is to understand and protect the planet and investigate the oceans, earth, and atmosphere to find solutions to our greatest environmental challenges. This webinar series focuses on two of our main core research initiatives, the first being risk and resilience to hazards, and the second being human health and the ocean. They occur quarterly, so please stay tuned and check our webinar website, which is uh, dropped in the chat for upcoming webinars and recordings of past presentations. The goal of this series is to inform our industry partners of our latest research and innovation, applied research tools, and ways to collaborate with our scientists and community to find mutually beneficial solutions. Just some quick housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and available again on our website afterwards. Feel free to distribute it to your colleagues. Also, you can find the Q&A button on the bottom center of the screen. Feel free to enter your questions throughout the presentation. We will have time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. If for some reason we're unable to get to your questions during this time, we will follow up with you afterwards. The Human and Environmental Health Initiative at Scripps Oceanography brings together researchers from a range of disciplines, including oceanography, climate and earth science, cellular biology, natural products medicine, computation, environmental sciences, toxicology, and public policy. As you can see here, we have four core themes, which are pollution, marine biomedical models and cell biology, natural products, and climate impacts on human health. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Distinguished Professor of Oceanography and Pharmaceutical Sciences here at Scripps Oceanography UC San Diego, Dr. Bill Groick. Bill's research focuses on the bioactive natural products of marine algae and cyanobacteria and their application in biomedicine and biosynthesis using genomic approaches. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry at UC Davis and PhD at Scripps Oceanography in Oceanography and Marine Chemistry and he did postdoc work in biosynthesis at University of Connecticut. After a junior faculty position in chemistry at the University of Puerto Rico, he spent 21 years at Oregon State University in the School of Pharmacy, and in 2005, he returned back here to Scripps. Bill has served as president of the American Society of Pharmacognisi, and as a society fellow of the American Society of Pharmacognisi and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he's chaired and co-chaired several major research conferences and was the associate editor of the Journal of Natural Products Chemistry. He currently serves as the director of the NIH training grant in marine biotechnology, and his research group has published close to 500 scientific papers and holds more than 20 U.S. patents. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Bill. Okay, well, thanks there, Vanessa. I'm really uh, uh, very excited to uh, present to this group, and I want to thank you, Vanessa, for the invitation to do so. Let me go ahead and get my screen shared. Okay, we're going to the presentation there. Yeah, so uh, not only does this field of marine natural products drug discovery, uh, it's one of uh, my uh, career and is of great excitement and uh, interest to me and my students, but uh, in the last few years, we've done some really fun things, uh, integrating some of the new uh, uh, opportunities and abilities in uh, artificial intelligence to accelerate this process of uh, marine drug discovery. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you a couple of the tools that we've been developing uh, in collaboration with a computer scientist uh, guru, if I can give him that term, uh, Gary Cottrell, at, in the uh, UCSD uh, Department of uh, Computer Engineering. So uh, before we go on though, I am by, uh, uh, have been uh, requested by our conflict of interest department here at UCSD to uh, go ahead and 
share this uh, 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 fact that I am a co-founder and have equity with this uh, company, NMR Finder, that was really started by my former students. And uh, I serve as a scientific advisor there. So we are managing our conflict of interest through the policies of UCSD. So with that uh, under uh, taken care of, uh, moving on, here's what I was uh, looking forward and looking forward to presenting to you today is some introduction to the Center on Marine Biotechnology technology and biomedicine. And I uh, uh, served as director of that up until a short time ago. And uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset uh, at, at Scripps Oceanography. Uh, and so uh, uh, that will segue into uh, some uh, overall perspectives on drugs from the sea. Is this a fact or fantasy? Um, and then I'll uh, come to talk about my main topic where we're uh, integrating artificial intelligence technologies into the natural product drug discovery process. Uh, what that's led to in one case is this compound we call gyenamide A from uh, actually coming from Panama uh, or a Panamanian marine cyanobacterium. And it's currently in evaluation for COVID-19 uh, uh, as a potential therapeutic. And I'll update you on that. And then some other uh, lead molecules from our lab. So. Moving along, uh, the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine was really uh, uh, initiated by Bill Fenical, a, a, a well-known pioneer in this field and uh, has contributed so much and served as director for, I think, maybe 20 years. Uh, and then uh, I uh, took over the reins for a, a while and now currently Brad Moore is in charge of this. But we're six faculty, but we're currently uh, seeking to hire two uh, new faculty. Uh, at the uh, uh, junior and middle level. And so we're super excited about that as we go through those negotiations to have uh, a couple of uh, new folks uh, join us. I think uh, it's important to recognize the unique resources that have been developed in, uh, at Scripps uh, as a result of the efforts there. Uh, we have probably the largest collection of marine microbes in the world, certainly of marine cyanobacteria, but Bill Fenical and Paul Jensen have uh, done, they're just uh, legends in the field of marine microbiology and drug discovery. So we have some very uh, unique collections of both the organisms and also of the natural products. So uh, collectively uh, between ourselves and our students and our visitors that uh, so abundantly come to Scripps as a, sort of a nexus of this type of research, uh, uh, we have expertise in natural product isolation and structural elucidation. Also, how these molecules are being put together uh, so the, uh, by the organisms that make them. So that's the biosynthesis, which is really blueprinted from their genomic information. And knowledge of that, of course, then opens the door for potential genetic engineering of these pathways to make unnatural natural products, as it's said. Uh, and a key part of that is bioinformatics. And ultimately, it's the biological activity of these molecules we're studying that is a, of such great importance and interest. So uh, the pharmacology and biomedical applications is another area. And so you're seeing six people here, but that's not really the team that's doing the work. We get together yearly uh, down on the beach by the pier and have a, a get together of all the groups. And as you can see, it's a really substantial group of people, uh, more than 100 uh, of uh, uh, students at all levels. Uh, from undergraduates to uh, postdoctoral researchers, uh, uh, PhD and master's students. But as I say, a lot of visitors as well come to UCSD and contribute to these efforts. And uh, a vision that was super appealing to me and coming back to Scripps from my time at Oregon State was this vision that was uh, developing on campus with the new school of pharmacy that came into being in the early 2000s that the, the, the structure on campus was, uh, had the opportunity to go all the way from the discovery phase through Scripps Oceanography efforts and natural products uh, from the sea, through the Skag School of Pharmacy and the, and the other uh, basic science departments on campus, chemistry and biology, for instance, all the way to the bedside at the Morris Cancer Center and our other clinical outlets. And indeed, uh, we are realizing this vision now uh, with some of the molecules that are coming through the process, specifically a sort of a flagship molecule, I would say, of UCSD in general, something known as selenosporamide that was discovered by uh, Bill Fenical and Paul Jensen is in phase three trials for treatment of glioblastoma, which is of course a very devastating uh, brain tumor. And uh, yeah, so uh, things are really going from seaside to bedside now. 
And uh, is this uh, the exception uh, that a natural product would be uh, a source of a drug weight? No, actually about 50% of all of our pharmaceuticals are in some sense derived from or inspired by natural products. In green, you see pieces of the pie of some, this is actually uh, 1,562 uh, drug molecules in the clinic, approved drugs. Uh, and uh, pieces of the pie in green are natural products, botanical drugs, a, a relatively new and small contributor. And then natural product derivatives. Think of all the uh, second, third, fourth generation antibiotics that are patterned after uh, 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 initial natural product classes. So those are natural product derivatives. Biologics and vaccines are a growing uh, a contributor to the, our pharmacopoeia. And then we have synthetic drugs on the left-hand side in uh, various colors of orange, yellow, and, and uh, red. Uh, but uh, the folks at the NCI, uh, David Newman and Gordon Craig in this uh, uh, series of articles that they've published on this topic of you know, where do we get our drugs from, uh, have traced back the origins of many of these synthetic drugs that they're actually mimicking a natural product, that the chemist didn't come up with that idea out of air, but rather uh, saw that there was a natural product that had pretty good activity at a particular target, but it didn't have good pharmaceutical properties. It couldn't be taken as an oral medication, et cetera. And so the uh, pharmaceutical properties were altered to give it uh, a, a good uh, uh, drug-like uh, features and that's uh, what we're seeing here in orange, red, and yellow. And so it's only about 30% of all drugs that are uh, truly uh, totally uh, produced by uh, chemical synthesis without a, an inspiration or derivation from natural products. And as we know, the marine environment is uh, incredibly rich in uh, species diversity. And this is particularly true in shallow water environments. Uh, although deep ocean uh, is uh, now uh, being uh, explored, but uh, uh, is incompletely understood. But the shallow uh, water environments are some of the richest on the planet for species diversity, and particularly so in the tropics as is captured in this uh, picture. And so what's, what's come from these so far? And here is a list of some 21 uh, natural product drugs or inspired uh, natural product drugs uh, that have a, a marine derivation. And what you're seeing with the yellow tags are various types of anti-cancer therapeutics. And that's principally because that's the agency in the United States that's largely funded this type of work is the National Cancer Institute, but maybe also reflects some of the, the highly competitive nature of the marine environment of species, species interaction and competition has led to a lot of compounds that are uh, essentially toxic. And to a large extent, that's uh, 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 traditionally our cancer chemotherapeutics are uh, talk, cell toxins. So we have uh, these uh, nucleosides at the top. We have uh, some very complex uh, polycyclic compounds uh, uh, in here that are deriving from mainly from microorganisms, but microorganisms that live in association with macroorganisms like tunicates and sponges. That's a very interesting aspect of chemical ecology. And then uh, this series of drugs down in the lower left corner are interesting in that they have a warhead that's sort of a peptide-like structure that's attached to a linker to a monoclonal antibody. And this is a, a series of drugs known as antibody drug conjugates that is sort of the, uh, the new, uh, some of the newest drugs coming out of the pharma industry uh, for cancer in particular, but for other indications we think in the future where a warhead is directed specifically to a cancer cell by that antibody. The warhead in this case is peptide structure it actually comes from a marine cyanobacterium and it's a very potent anti-tubulant agent. So cancer dominates this, but you can see other drug classes, antivirals, anti-hyperlipidemic agents, and some uh, uh, miscellaneous agents that are of a macromolecular structure type. So this is a, a pretty good track record relative to the level of effort that's been put in. Uh, and there's another 23 agents that are in various phases of uh, human clinical trial. So things are moving. So natural products investigations though are pretty laborious uh, as they're traditionally uh, uh, done um, in that they're a, a series of steps. We have uh, first to gain access to the organisms themselves. Uh, that starts with getting legal uh, permits to make those collections. 
uh, and uh, that's uh, if that's occurring in foreign countries, there's uh, additional layers of paperwork to uh, be done. But uh, then the very enjoyable part of going out in the field and making these collections with my students over the years has been a lot of fun. And we go through a process of uh, making extracts and uh, isolating compounds, usually in response to a biological assay. So we isolate a bioactive compound. And then we want to know, of course, what's the structure of that molecule? And that can be a very time consuming and costly process. Uh, uh, and it's highly dependent upon the experience level of the investigator, a, a new student will have a lot of problems cutting their teeth on a complex molecular structure. Now I have to say, actually, some molecules we've encountered in my lab over the years, we've never been able to figure the structures out. They've just been too complex for the technologies we have available. So this is a major bottleneck in the overall process. And it's this bottleneck that we're trying to address with some of this new artificial intelligence technology. So we, I think all realize at this point in time of uh, our uh, society and culture is that we have facial recognition software and it's being used abundantly in a variety of uh, security settings. Uh, and uh, so a, a, an individual that has uh, uh, been a, a leader in that field, uh, Gary Cottrell, as I mentioned, uh, we uh, approached him with this idea, could we use that same technology to recognize molecules by sort of their face. And the face that we chose to look at is this uh, set of spots that's on a piece of paper. This actually, these is a contours. And it shows the uh, relationships of protons in a molecule to their respective carbon atoms that they're attached to. I know that it's a fairly chemically oriented aspect, but is necessary in order to uh, define the molecular structure of a compound. But, uh, I think the concept is not so difficult to understand is that we have spots that define a face, we have spots on a piece of paper that maybe define a molecule. Well, this was an unproven concept and uh, we, uh, uh, and so it's been really a bit pioneering on our part as a collaborative team to try and use this uh, uh, deep convolutional neural net, so-called deep learning to recognize the face of a molecule. Uh, so this is now available as a, a publicly available uh, website where one can simply dump in, I'll show you in a moment, uh, dump in data and get an answer uh, in about six to eight seconds. So it's a, a pretty remarkable tool indeed. Here's just another perspective on this is that uh, uh, in the same way we all recognize QR codes can contain a lot of information in a very consolidated uh, way that is uh, uh, represented visually, these uh, HSQC spectra, which I'm showing down in the lower right-hand corner, they're also sort of an encapsulated way which inherently hold a lot of information about the structure of a molecule, which is what's shown on the left-hand side of the bottom. So we've gone through several iterations of this. We initially were, and this is a general issue for uh, uh, many fields of, uh, for big, science, uh, big data science is getting good at in the beginning, and we had to resort to a particular type of architecture, but uh, that uh, is uh, now been overcome, that we were able to, in fact, calculate the data for a lot of organic molecules and hence populate one of these uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, this was uh, also complemented by some other databases that we became aware of uh, later on in the process. And so this convolutional neural net, a CNN, it works in 180 dimensional space. I have no concept of what that space looks like. Fortunately, we uh, can query that space and we can say, okay, this molecule that we don't know, when we put it into this uh, facial recognition software, it will put it in, in close proximity to other faces, other molecules of close uh, uh, resemblance. And we get a great insight into what kind of a molecule we might be dealing with. Uh, so this works great. And now we've uh, come up with a, a, a even newer idea is that uh, even though the SMART 2.0 is uh, great in that we have 120,000 compounds set to compare to, there's approximately 400,000 known uh, natural product structures. And there's many, uh, probably an equal number of unknown natural product structures still left to discover. So what about all of those? And for that, we have a, a converted the learning 
from being a HSQC spectrum, this proton carbon correlation spectrum, to something called Morgan fingerprints. And I'll explain what those are in just a minute, but it's a really intriguing concept. And that's uh, some of the enthusiasm I feel for this, 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 uh, this field is that integrating it is probably fun to uh, discover and to uh, uh, do some uh, creative innovations. So here, as we are looking at SMART 2.0, uh, we uh, uh, take an unknown molecule and we query it against this data set and it's compared in three dimensional. We do a data reduction, excuse me, dimension reduction to three dimensions from that 180 dimensional space. And then we can actually look and see uh, where our molecule fits. And that's what this, uh, 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 in the slide coming up in just a minute, uh, we'll show you. It's a very simple process, harder to explain and easier to watch. So hold on for just a minute. So I'm gonna briefly illustrate the use of this uh, in the uh, sh a short art, uh, description of a, a molecule we discovered from American Samoa in the South Pacific, in this beautiful Bay of Batia Bay. And uh, diving into the water <laughs> and giving a little flick of the fin there, we're down underwater and making collections of uh, this uh, cyanobacterium. Now these cyanobacteria in the tropics, they oftentimes grow as mats or tufts that we can see with the naked eye, in fact, the large amounts that we can collect by hand. So here it is what it looks like under a microscope, but in fact, we can collect these by hand as they uh, are bacteria that have escaped a microscopic lifestyle. They're actually macroscopic organisms in many cases. So uh, this one was collected and uh, fractionated, and then we tested it for anti-cancer type activity or cancer cell toxicity. We found that the uh, fractions uh, eluding late in this uh, chromatography were the active fractions. And so we combined those two fractions and we ran an HSQC spectrum of them. And, and so you can see the correlations for the protons to their respective carbon atoms. And so that's sort of the face of the molecule. So how do we actually use those data? Okay, so this is a little video my student uh, Chen Zhang put together for us. And so you just go to this website and then he pulls up some data as an Excel file. And it's just the tabulated data for the protons and their carbon and XY coordinate type system. And as I say, about eight seconds later, up pops the, that's the HSQC spectrum that the data indicated. And here are some suggested structures where we're gonna look at this now in three dimensions. And we're gonna look and see our query structure in the middle in that red dot and its relationship to a host of other compounds in this uh, HSQC space. And we can uh, look at this in different ways. Previously, you were just looking at the names of the molecules. Now we can look at the names and we actually, when we zoom in a little bit, you can see that there's actual molecular structures on each of those little tags. So in real time, we can go in and look and see in exactly the amount of time that it's taken to show this slide uh, and see, ah, our molecule is related to one of those. And that gives us a huge uh, head start on figuring out what the molecule is. So here, uh, the, uh, so we can look at a little bit slower speed, uh, the, the molecules that return, were returned from that uh, combined fraction H and I that was, had some cancer cell toxicity. And uh, Raphael Reher, the chemist working on this project, went on to isolate the compounds. And indeed, they were closely related structures to what uh, were represented in the database and returned by the SMART tool. In fact, they were sort of hybrids between two different uh, known molecular structure classes. And uh, these are complex molecules by any stretch of the imagination. And so getting this uh, 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 quick insight as to what structure class we were dealing with was, was huge. Okay, so here's the development of the sort of commercial arm of my student Chen Zhang and a colleague of his, uh, I'll introduce you to the team in just a minute, have uh, been working on it. But the original concept comes from about uh, six years ago uh, where we were thinking, could we do something of this type? And we initiated it with a purely mathematical model showing uh, that the uh, uh, vectors that could be used to describe these uh, correlations could be compared with one another and uh, 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 so-called multi-dimensional vectors could be compared by a cosine value and that it actually worked. 
So uh, it was then that we contacted our colleague, Gary Cottrell, and started to use convolutional neural nets to see these relationships. And that worked well, so such that we created uh, this company, NMR Finder. And in 2020, we uh, uh, advanced this with uh, more data and a more sophisticated algorithm. And in 2020, later in the year, so even during COVID-19, uh, it was a good time to do computer work. Uh, and uh, my uh, uh, postdoc, uh, Han Wu Kim, an extraordinarily talented individual, put together this smart 3.0 concept. Uh, and we've been in licensing uh, discussions with UCSD uh, about this with NMR, between NMR Finder and UCSD. And we've uh, recognized through collaborations with uh, MD Anderson that there's some uh, biomedical applications to this that we hadn't initially thought about. And so we think there's some real uh, commercial opportunities with this, but we, we, need, uh, we need resources. Uh, we need uh, some uh, capital to, uh, uh, take this forward to the next level. And, and that's something that uh, Chen Zhang is leading the charge with. So the smart tool uh, presents uh, uh, in an automatic fashion, the molecular structure of an organic compound, be it for drug discovery purposes, pharmaceutical testing, or uh, as an aid in cancer surgery. I'll come back to that point in a moment. And it's much faster than doing it this by hand. Uh, and can be compared to, as I say, to hundreds of thousands of molecules in seconds. And, uh, and hence it's uh, much quicker and much more thorough than a, a human-based process. And it's a tool. It's not the, it isn't the rigorous structural elucidation. That's still a, a, a process that uh, humans uh, have to get involved in, but it, uh, it's an accelerating tool in that overall process. So here's some potential applications that we've considered, and uh, of course, in pharmaceutical drug discovery. Uh, diagnosis of disease. This is a, a very exciting uh, possibility and opportunity that, as I mentioned, we're working with MD Anderson on this, that uh, they uh, have been able to see that particular types of cancers, glioblastomas, for instance, have a particular metabolic profile. Certain organic compounds are present distinctively in the tumor tissue and not in normal tissue. And this gives rise to the idea that one could distinguish uh, cancer tissue from healthy tissue in a way, uh, possibly in real time, such that it could direct a, a, a surgical excision of a cancer in a very precise way. We also see this as a tool to be used in quality control, in agricultural practices, environmental monitoring, for instance, of algal, toxic algal blooms, and the perfume and fragrance industry, uh, food safety, uh, forensics and uh, government agencies that want to make sure that uh, uh, the molecule is what they say it is. We've also had inquiries from uh, scientific journals that deal with chemical structures that uh, the data could be popped into this tool and just be an extra check on whether the authors have considered uh, uh, the, the, all the possibilities for the, uh, perhaps a new molecular structure that they're presenting. So uh, this went uh, live just before uh, COVID-19 hit. Uh, so December of 2019, uh, the, the website for the SMART 2.0 went live and it's been used now over 6,000 times in over 50 countries. And it's becoming a, a widely employed uh, tool in the uh, academic science. And we think also in the uh, pharmaceutical, uh, 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 pharmaceutical company space as well. So the people involved in the uh, NMR Finder team, as I mentioned, Chen Zhang uh, is uh, joined by Preston Landon. Uh, Gary Cottrell and myself serve as uh, 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 co-founders, but also as advisors to uh, the effort. And uh, then we have a couple of more business oriented uh, people in Aaron Landon and Fred Haney. So I'd like to share with you a, a, another story of a natural product sort that I'm uh, very excited about that's uh, come about really in times of COVID-19, although it started before that. We've been working in Panama for the last uh, about uh, oh, close to 20 years uh, through a program I'll introduce you to in a minute, but uh, circled in red are some of the collection, collection locations that we've had, uh, which are the National Park System of Panama. Uh, the Cueva Island is an infamous uh, island for its notorious prison 
that was operational there for 100 years. It's now the prison is closed down. It's now a national park and a world heritage site because it really escaped much development. And we've had opportunities to make some collections out there. The collection I'm going to talk about today comes up from uh, Portobello near to Isla Grande on the uh, Caribbean coast, the Atlantic coast of, of Panama. And uh, But here's looking out at uh, Cueva, you can see it, how untouched it is, this uh, lowland tropical jungle and the uh, uh, quite mountainous island of Cueva. Uh, I've never been, I've been many places in the world, never a place as remote and untouched as, as Cueva. So it is uh, truly a world heritage site. And the program we were involved in, uh, and I served as PI of for about 15 of those years, was uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health through their uh, Fogarty International Center. And it was called an International Cooperative Biodiversity Group. And it had equal weighting to different dimensions of science and society that uh, uh, really uh, uh, enhanced one another in a very productive way. So we were very concerned with the ecology of the organisms we were studying. We we're focused on tropical disease and cancer, particularly tropical diseases afflicting people in Central America and Panama. Uh, we engaged in biodiversity inventories and conservation in some of these habitats that for which, uh, where there's been very little investigation and, and have contributed to just fundamental knowledge there. And uh, we were also very much involved in uh, helping to develop the infrastructure for science in Panama. We brought two NMR spectrometers to the, to the country uh, and several mass spectrometers and trained a lot of people that uh, uh, in, uh, when I was at Oregon State and then subsequently here at, at uh, SIO, UCSD, uh, that have gone back to Panama and now lead those efforts independently in Panama. And that's led to some economic development and outreach. So uh, a, a wonderful program and it was done in a very ethical manner that uh, uh, was extremely satisfying. And from that, we discovered back in 2009, this little organic molecule you can see here called, we called gyenamide A after the location of a, the collection of the marine cyanobacterium, uh, Punta gyenus. So we called it after that, the gyenamide. And, uh, we initially collect, uh, found that the molecule, uh, the extract, and then subsequently the molecule showed some anti-malarial activity, but it was fairly weak. Uh, then back here in, uh, at UCSD, uh, we came to realize this molecule was exquisitely potent at inhibiting a particular human enzyme called cathepsin L, which is involved in neuropeptide processing and might be a target for a non-addictive pain uh, therapeutic. <clears throat> At the same time, or nearly so, we also found that it was quite active to an enzyme that's key for the Chagas disease causing organism, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi. And uh, then with our uh, COVID-19 uh, experience that we've all uh, uh, been suffering under, um, a lot of uh, uh, understanding of how that virus gets into cells has uh, been developed. And it turns out that cathepsin L is a key player in how the viral particle gets actually into cells and into the cytoplasm proper. <clears throat> and so we tested gyenamide A for uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity, found it to be exquisitely active. And uh, earlier this month, it went through uh, trials in a mouse model system for in vivo antiviral anti-COVID-19 effects. And uh, we're expecting to get data back from that uh, any day now. So hoping for uh, some nice success there. Here's just a picture of how this uh, occurs. Um, here are uh, the SARS-CoV-1 or 2. Uh, they uh, uh, bind to the ACE2 receptor of related coronavirus, the MERS-CoV uh, virus, uh, binds to a different receptor, the DPP4. But subsequently, the downstream steps are pretty much the same. Uh, there are a couple of different routes of entry uh, of the SARS-CoV-2, but into many cells that uh, first goes into an endosome and it escapes the endosome only by the activity of the host enzyme, cathepsin L, cleaving off a part of the spike protein that's uh, depicted on the outer surface. And that allows the uh, spike protein uh, remnant to fuse with the membrane and uh, allow escape from the endosome where then viral replication and all the downstream effects take place. 
So uh, this uh, gainamide A is an exciting lead molecule from our lab, but we have several others. And I'll just, uh, the only slide on this, so coming close to the end, is uh, in the middle, you're seeing a molecule that's a synthetic compound that we made in the laboratory, but it's patterned after a molecule we discovered from a cyanobacterium collected in Curacao. And there's the distinctive feature of this, it has this epoxy ketone on the right-hand side that is sort of a warhead feature. And then these various uh, amino acid components are the specificity uh, components that give it its a uh, very uh, high selectivity to the malaria parasite. So we're quite excited about that, working with Gates Foundation uh, on some of uh, its development. And then on the far right-hand side, you can see this pretty complex cyclic peptide comes from a Papua New Guinea marine cyanobacterium. It and some related compounds have a very novel mechanism of uh, cancer cell toxicity and quite selective for pancreatic cancer. The target is uh, spe specifically uh, highly uh, prevalent in uh, pancreatic tissues. Pancreatic cancer, of course, is one of the most lethal and uh, for which we have uh, 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 an unmet medical need. So we're pretty excited about that compound as well. Okay, so <clears throat> as I uh, described it previously, you know, Scripps UCSD is really a nexus in the world for uh, marine drug discovery research as a result of the uh, rich history we have and the strength that's occurred from recent hires and we hope uh, the two new hires that we're currently negotiating. Uh, the marine environment, it's maybe not widely recognized, but it's actually uh, uh, quite a, a successful uh, uh, endeavor to look to marine organisms as sources of new drug leads. If one just runs numbers, uh, it's been uh, more successful than looking at, uh, in terms of the numbers, it's been, uh, the number of things that have to be investigated in order to yield a single new drug agent is less for the marine environment than it is for the terrestrial environment. So we have quite a good uh, record there. I think it's a pretty exciting time to be doing this kind of work. As you can tell, we're excited by the computational science, but equally uh, the, the new techniques in molecular biology and using that to direct uh, drug discovery efforts and uh, the uh, extraordinarily uh, powerful analytical chemical tools that we have now are making uh, molecular structure determination uh, a much more reasonable process. And finally, as uh, uh, one of my slides, I hope really uh, clearly communicate, this occurs with a, a few PIs, but just an incredibly uh, talented and enthusiastic and motivated group of students at all levels from high school to postdoctoral and beyond. So with that, I just, uh, again, uh, people in my lab uh, above the line are some current students and postdocs and uh, some recently graduated students and postdocs. <clears throat> this highly interdisciplinary work, so it involves collaboration with a lot of other laboratories around UCSD and elsewhere. And uh, the whole lab's vaccinated now, so we were able to get together for a little celebration of uh, Kelsey Alexander, uh, uh, shown in the lower left-hand corner, just recently uh, completed her PhD uh, in our laboratory. With that, uh, again, I thank uh, Vanessa for the invitation to present to you today and look forward to uh, questions and discussions we might have now. Thanks very much. Excellent, thank you so much, Bill, for that great presentation. We've got some questions that have come in already that I would like to begin with. Um, great feedback, and thank you all so much for submitting your questions. Um, the first is from Andrew Taylor. He's asking, can you please explain in simple terms how you obtain the mo molecular face map of the protons to the carbon atoms? Yeah, this is a, it, it, there might not be an easy answer to this, my apologies. Uh, so uh, a proton uh, spectrum, uh, I think it sounds like you uh, appreciate that, that we have uh, protons in a molecule, they have different chemical environments, and so they resonate in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we see that as a series of peaks at different locations. Same with the carbon atoms in a molecule. To see the correlations between those, we actually run a whole series of experiments. And then we line those and we uh, uh, modulate those experiments uh, increment. Uh, little by little, we change some of the delays in them so that we see these correlations between uh, protons and carbons. And it's actually a series of stacked NMR experiments. 
that then uh, we look at in a contour plot. So those spots are actually the, the mountaintops of a, a, a contour plot. So it's, it's a so-called two-dimensional NMR experiment. And well, uh, uh, Nobel prizes have been awarded for development of some of these uh, kind of uh, uh, pioneering two-dimensional NMR experiments. I hope that's enough explanation for you today. Oh, Vanessa, you're, uh, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, Andrew has said thank you. So I think you answered his question. Um, next question is from Carlos Murillo. He says, thank you, I love the presentation. I have a passion for marine biology and biotech. I'd like to know how I can get involved and collaborate with this kind of project. I'm from Panama, an undergraduate student. Um, yeah. Great, uh, and the question is if you're here in San Diego or are you in Panama? Uh, in Panama uh, at the uh, Indicasat uh, is a former postdoc of mine, uh, Marcelino Gutierrez. Uh, he reads, leads a very uh, active laboratory there. Uh, but, and there's several others at Indicasat that are involved in marine drug discovery. Uh, also at the University of Panama, um, uh, there's uh, some active laboratories and at the Smithsonian Institution. So you have several opportunities in Panama. Here at UCSD, actually uh, it's not all occurring at, at SIO. We have uh, indeed one of the strongest programs in the world in marine drug discovery with uh, the six faculty I shared with you and our students. But we also have some really great labs in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, 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 Ted Malinsky up in uh, chemistry and in uh, the School of Pharmacy. My appointments jointly between Scripps and pharmacy as is Brad Morse, but there's a few other people up in the School of Pharmacy that have their sole appointment in pharmacy like Peter Dorstein. So there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, if you're interested in uh, pursuing these, uh, I, I'd be happy to uh, 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 receive an email from you and uh, either uh, look for the opportunities or direct you to somebody that uh, might have an opportunity in their lab. Great, thank you, Bill. All right, we've got a question from Brian Zabalos. He said, great, this is impressive. Is SMART a freely accessible tool? It seems similar to AlphaFold, but for determining the structure of small molecules instead of protein structures. Oh, great point. Um, Yes, it is a freely available tool at the website that uh, I think uh, you were going to put that in the chat, Vanessa, is that correct? So correct. that website, uh, and it was on a couple of my slides, uh, freely accessible, uh, very easy to use. I think the documentation is pretty clear. The format of the data in the Excel file has to be exactly right. So there's a comma with no space and then a number, and, and some people have gotten messed up on, on using that. So if you just read the documentation to get the format right, this tool is as simple to use as I showed you in that, uh, in that animated slide. Excellent. All right, we've got a question from Eleanor Coppins. She's asking for, can you further optimize the NMR finder, finder tool with infrared and mass spectrometry? That's a great, uh, great question. And we are in fact doing that right now, not with infrared, but with the mass spectrometry. Uh, and I can tell you the short story, the long story. I'll tell you an intermediate story if I could. Uh, the intermediate story is that uh, uh, colleagues in the School of Pharmacy, Peter Dorstein and Nuno Bandera, created a tool called uh, Global Natural Products Social Molecular Networking. It's based on mass spec information and specifically on MSMS -MS spectra, that is uh, uh, the, the, the fragments that derive from a, a, a molecular ion. And they created a mathematical model that then connects related molecules to one another by MSMS spectra. So it's an automatic annotation tool, not unlike what you're seeing with NMR. In fact, uh, it was the creation of this mass spec based model that inspired us to say, hmm, could we do something like this with NMR? And we went another direction. We went, moved away from a mathematical model to a, a deep convolutional neural net where it learns its own rules about how to do this. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. We've got so many oh, great questions. And I just want to say, and so we are uh, also now integrating some mass spec data into uh, the algorithm, and it makes it considerably more uh, uh, accurate to do so, because uh, especially if a molecule has symmetry, the NMR would only see one part of that if it's uh, symmetrical. So add in the mass spec data, and it's a much more powerful tool.
Uh, we've got a question here from Claudia Hernandez Merlot asking, in the case of developing a new drug from the cyanobacteria coming from Panama, what is the what are the economic benefits for the people collaborating in Panama? Ah, so uh, before, you know, as a part of this program, which was, as I say, uh, 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 organized and funded and to a degree uh, managed uh, by the Fogarty International Center is that we uh, signed paperwork with the national uh, uh, level governmental organizations in charge of the environment, uh, a group called ANOM. I can't recall exactly what their uh, Spanish uh, interpretation of that acronym is, but ANOM is the uh, agency. And so uh, the people of Panama uh, is several fold. Uh, uh, one is uh, there is a strong impetus to try and locate any production facility for anything that should come out of this type of work in Panama. So the economic uh, development would occur there. Uh, and then a, a percentage, a high percentage of resources that come back to the university would go back to ANOM. It would be the uh, uh, caretaker of any funds coming into the country uh, deriving from uh, uh, resources generated from sales if, if, if it actually became a drug molecule. And ultimately in this case, if it's a COVID-19, uh, uh, if it successfully uh, treats the disease and people that are unvaccinated or whatever the future holds for us with this, uh, with this virus, uh, you know, we're all gonna benefit there. Excellent. I think this next question dovetails on that perfectly. Uh, after developing the pharmaceutical, a oh, question from Valentina. After developing the pharmaceutical, how will it be commercialized without harming the marine environment? Will the organism, organisms um, collected be from the ocean or artificially synthesized? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, in many cases, when we collect these organisms uh, and uh, uh, work with them. We're, as I say, able to collect them by hand and large uh, biomass and make extracts and directly isolate these compounds and determine structures. We also try and take a small amount and grow it in the laboratory so we have access to the genetic material. And uh, we and others are now uh, working sort of on a frontier to, we can grow the organism and it will produce, but these are very slow growing organisms under very challenging conditions. Uh, we're not able to grow all of them. And in fact, we don't have the producer of gyenamide A in culture. We just never could get it to grow. But in other cases, we can get it to grow, but only slowly. So we're working on technologies to excise the set of genes from the wild type producer and move it into another microorganism that we can grow uh, more easily. So so-called heterologous expression. In this case on gyenamide A, and I think for many other drugs, uh, uh, the synthetic organic chemistry uh, technology is advanced uh, well enough that that's gonna be the most economical way to produce the compound. In fact, the compound that went in has gone into trials in mice uh, was synthesized in the, in the laboratory for that purpose. Excellent, thank you, Bill. Um, we've got a couple of questions from Marina. She's asking, uh, thank you for a great presentation. What resources are there to learn how to use SMART and potentially integrate it into projects, say for as, as an undergraduate? And then also, do you have plans to create a similar tool with genomic or transgenomic data? Oh, two wonderful questions. The first, let me uh, respond. So there is an effort uh, uh, that's uh, the, uh, an effort led by uh, a, a very well-known professor at the University of Wisconsin, Joe Handelsman. She and her uh, laboratory and a number of other people have contributed to a worldwide effort called Tiny Earth. Uh, Tiny Earth uh, uh, promotes uh, 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 curricula and, uh, and also a connectedness to uh, potential drug discovery uh, uh, kind of uh, with uh, University of Wisconsin being the uh, linchpin in that whole effort uh, from, uh, 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 to look for new antibiotics from microorganisms. And so there's quite a lot of uh, 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 universities and uh, colleges that are using this curriculum in the United States and interestingly in Spain. Uh, here in San Diego at uh, Point Loma Nazarene uh, College, Catherine Maloney is a, a professor there, and she is a sort of local 
uh, conduit and a participator in the Tiny Earth Project. The Tiny Earth Project is developing a textbook for this uh, uh, effort. And as a part of that, a chapter will be on the use of SMART to accelerate for, because one of the things is uh, uh, anybody, if you can record the spectrum or have the spectrum recorded for you by a, an NMR facility, for instance, of a molecule you've isolated, or even an impure material that you've isolated that has some useful activity, you anybody can uh, easily dump it into the SMART program and get some insights into what kinds of molecules they're working with. And if it's a molecule that's in the SMART database, you'll get an absolute identification that, of what that molecule is. So it's, uh, it's a tool that can be used at a, uh, by a non-specialist. And I think that's a, a, an exciting dimension of, this, of the SMART tool. Excellent, thank you, Bill. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Oh, Marina just said, thank you. <laughs> I think there was a second question though that she had, and I don't know that I got to the second one. Great, do you want me to, let's see. Yes, do you have plans to create a similar tool with genomic or transcriptomic data? Ah, and that's a, a second great question is, uh, yes, uh, uh, there are tools being developed uh, at UCSD in the laboratory of uh, Nuno Bandera uh, uh, with inputs from myself and several others. In fact, we just received a, a new NIH grant. Uh, well, actually it's a renewal of an NIH grant to further develop some of the genomic, uh, 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 genomic tools, some aspect-based tools and the NMR-based tools. So, uh, and actually Dr. Lena Gerwick, and yes, she is related, <laughs> is, is uh, also very much engaged in the genomic uh, uh, development. Excellent. We do have another question that just came in from Eleanor Coppins again. Um, she's asking, how do you test therapeutic activity of poorly water soluble molecules? Do you test formulation as nanoparticles? Well, that's a really good question. Formulation, if the molecule doesn't actually get into the test organism, you haven't really tested the molecule. So that's a, a very good point. Um, and some of these uh, molecules are quite lipophilic. And so they are a challenge to formulate, to uh, get them into solution so that they actually get into the organism or into the test system. So we, we, uh, we're not formulation chemists, which is a whole uh, separate branch of uh, uh, pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, but we've learned a few things along the, along the way. Uh, so we have found we formulated that the most difficult compound that we formulated was in a mixture of uh, uh, DMSO, which you can't use at a very high concentration in an animal system, but a, another uh, solubilizer known as solutol is uh, uh, quite benevolent and can be used at higher concentrations uh, than along with uh, phosphate buffered saline. So a combination of that with sonication and warming and so forth, we, we work hard to get these into solution, but that's, that's a real challenge. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. I think that wraps up our questions that we have submitted. Um, I guess one final question that would um, be something to just ask is if people wanna reach out or find out more about ways to collaborate uh, what would be the best place to navigate them to? Ah, yes. Well, uh, the CM, excuse me, the CMBB website. Uh, you can find uh, the links to the uh, all the professors that are involved and associated with CMBB. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I would certainly be welcoming to uh, if somebody uh, wanted to email me and ask some questions. I'll I'll look for your emails and try and respond within a, a day or two. Um, I uh, was particularly excited to hear that there was a student from Panama on the line. So thanks for attending. I look forward to perhaps following up with you. Um, there's, uh, I think we uh, had a final slide on that and we didn't get around to showing that. So if you don't mind, I'll just bring that forward. Sure. Once again, and I, I stopped on this pretty slide. So we'll go to the, <laughs> the last slide was that, uh, the idea of working with us, uh, there's the, the Scripps uh, Corporate Alliance. That's something that, uh, uh, Vanessa, you're very much involved in. There is, you know, we have an incredibly talented group of, of people that are coming through our programs. And uh, 
we hate to see them go when they graduate because uh, you know you develop a several year relationship with them and uh, they're very talented uh, but this is what we have to do we have to let them go on in their careers so uh, and many of them go to a local industry or or elsewhere uh, there is of course opportunities to sponsor some of this research and uh, there's also opportunities to collaborate and, and license and then there's uh, uh, opportunities for educational uh, and other other types of collaborations so Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you all so much for your great questions and for your attention and for your participation today. We really appreciate it. Again, this webinar recording will be available on our website, um, which you can find in the link in the chat, and you will also receive an email follow up uh, with a link to the recording as well. So thank you again and stay tuned. We will have more webinars coming up later this summer, um, probably in the risk and resilience uh, research initiative, and we hope you all have a wonderful day and look forward to continuing the conversation. And again, please feel free to reach out, reach out with us to uh, explore collaboration opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Bill.